So, uh, like Marina said, I am a sociologist and social anthropologist with an immigrant background myself. I studied immigrants. Um, and, uh, this is my main focus in, the, in the social science. And as it happens, I'm a Russian Jewish person uh, who made a move from one country and culture to another in, in midlife as a young PhD with a beginning academic career. And actually, I've spent half of my life in Moscow and the other half in Tel Aviv. So I'm evenly split between the two, two segments. And um, I've devoted many years to understanding this incredibly complicated journey of uh, uh, immigrants who moved from uh, the former Soviet lands, a huge Soviet, post-Soviet fire that embraces 11 time zones, a stick of wood with you know, land, uh, and then all of them are spread between different locations on the map. But uh, as it happens, Israel has the largest Russian Jewish community, but also the large communities of uh, Russian speaking Jews in this country, in Canada, in Europe, particularly in Germany. So, my special interest was studying those different islands of the Russian Jewish post Soviet diaspora in comparison. Of course, the national context for it. But today we are speaking about um, the main interest, the bulk of my studies have been about Russian speakers in Israel. And I'm building this talk um, around the concept of uh, tribes, Shatim in Hebrew. I understand that there's a single person in this room that understands Hebrew, right? That's all I'm trying to maybe do as well. Are we? Ah, okay. And Anna? And you? Okay, that's not there, but four persons. Very nice. So I, I may throw in the word here and there, but that's great. Right. So um, the Russian tribe in Israel and its dilemmas of inclusion, exclusion, belonging, non belonging. And of course, I start from the iconic picture of this incredible diversity of the Jews, the Jewish people who speak a host of languages and look very different and come from a very wide range of societies. And uh, given that Israel is the single Jewish state that is comprised mostly of immigrants on the Jewish side, over 95% of Israel's Jewish population are first, second, and third generation immigrants. So the composition of the society is incredibly pluralist, diverse, but of course one step further and we arrive to the notion of tribalism, because diversity and plurality are positive, but tribalism are already more problematic. And uh, um, we know that this society that tries to keep a united front towards the outside world is incredibly fragmented on many, many lines um, by ethnic origin, by religion and religiosity, by political camp. And of course, those who arrived recently, these are the long timers, veterans, and sabers, those who were born in Israel, Israel natives. Um, are all in different, you know, cells, camps, sectors, etc. And it's increasingly difficult even to say what the Israeli mainstream is, who are typical, you know, ultimate Israeli. They, they are so, so different. Um, and this uh, canon or metaphor of tribes, of course, was introduced. Uh, by President, former President Rivlin in uh, 2015, and his speech about the increasing segmentation of the Israeli society struck a nerve, became a very popular framing on the ethnic schisms and conflicts in this country. Um, so um, the number of tribes and sub tribes is, is increasing. He was speaking about three major tribes, and I'm speaking about five or six, we'll uh, detail it. Uh, but um, 
the, uh, you know, the problem of this split into fives is, of course, about deteriorating social solidarity. It is quite prominent uh, within the tribes, within the segment of society, within the seven, within Caribbean, within the orphans, within Ethiopian Jews, more or less. Um, but it's very questionable between the tribes. And the extent of social solidarity and unification um, spikes during major crises, one of which was witnessed on these days, of course, starting from early October. But then, when the crisis subsides, the conflicts and uh, struggles and political rifts come back. So I'm afraid we are at this phase right now when uh, the conflicts are taking over. So the main lines of division, before we go to my main interest in all line, the Russian Soviet, ex-Soviet Jews, so-called Russian people, the collective label Russians, although of course not everyone comes from Russia, actually even more come from Ukraine and from other republics of the former Soviet space, but everybody is a Russian speaker. So basically the growth of common language uh, is something that makes us one in the face of the Israeli speaking people. So the divisions are, of course, uh, first of all, along ethno-national lines. And there are Jews and Arabs, Israeli Arabs, or Palestinian Israelis, um, who are about 22% by now of the Israel's population within the Green Line. I'm speaking about Israel proper, international recognized territory. And uh, there is an old division of between Ashkenazim and Sparadim on Israel, which are slightly different categories, but they also merged. The Jews coming from Europe and the Americas, these are the Jews coming from the Middle East, Southern Europe, and the Arab speaking world, and the Gothic Jews, who are all very different. So, lumping them together in this pan ethnic category of Israel. Like Ashkenazim, it's, it's it's much absurd because within it, the every group is very very different. But still, there is this major collective label that is mostly based on socioeconomic differences and state of differences within society. Because historically, Ashkenazim, European Jews were the founders of the Israeli society, and they still belong to the main echelons of elites: business, political, economic, military. It's still mostly dominated by uh, all the Chinese, although it's changing very quickly. So, um, continuing the ethno national spirits, if you open to black Jews, came from Africa mostly in the 80s and early 90s. Um, their number is estimated by now something like 150,000, including the second and third generation. Uh, there are also heterogeneous communities that come from different parts of the country, and there are also um, part of them are recognized as Jews by the Israeli religious establishment, and others are not because they, um, they were baptized historically, and some of them have Judaism and are asking to insert the Jewish faith. But their, their entry, Aliyah, to Israel was very contested. There's a lot of disagreement whether they, they did belong to the, to the Jewish, to the lost Jewish tribe, which is their village. One of the lost Jewish tribes that found itself in historic Abyssinia, in Ethiopia, and many of the countries as well. So then, of course, there's the major line of state by religiosity, because we have this continuum between secular and traditional, from mildly observant. Religious and Caribbean who are ultra orthodox, um, and uh, they disagree about many things uh, as long as lifestyle is concerned. Um, the Karedi and those orthodox live uh, separately from other Israelis in their own towns and neighborhoods, and they build an invisible wall between themselves and uh, the rest of the country. Um, then another division that is increasingly Reported and politically contested, problematic also in the eyes of the outside world, is 
living within or beyond the green line. Green line is the 1948 uh, independence war armistice line, which is which divides the internationally recognized um, territories of Israel and vis a vis the territories occupied after 1967, where um, some Israelis return or were compelled to settle for economic reasons. Not everybody is an ideological um, settler, but still people who live beyond the green line find themselves in, uh, in a difficult situation. And then, of course, there are political camps, like in every country. <laughs> uh, there are people who are more left leaning or central or right, right, extreme right, even. And there are correlations between political affiliations and this is the religiosity and the set. So uh, from now on, I'm going to concentrate on my favorite segment of the Israeli puzzle, the Russian speakers who are, as you will see shortly, a very large and important chunk of Israel's population making a very significant imprint on all aspects of Israeli life, society, politics, economy. Well, together we comprise, I'm saying we because I'm one of them, we comprise about 40% of uh, all ethnic origin groups in Israeli Jews. So basically Russian speakers or former Soviets are the largest ethnic cultural linguistic population, comprising about 1.2 million, and most of them arrived after 1990 in the light of the collapse and uh, post Soviet transition in, in the Soviet uh, territories. Now, uh, Russian is very generation 1.5, those who arrived as children or adolescents. Like Marina said, this is the focus of my recent research. Mm -hmm. They are about 17% of all young adults in Israel, a very big chunk of. Uh, People who work, who serve in the military, who are families, you know, they are a Russian origin. Uh, now, in some towns of the geo social periphery, so called, we have this notion in Israel of center and periphery, uh, meaning major metropolitan concentrations, Tel Aviv and uh, Greater Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv and Dan, the Jerusalem agglomeration, Haifa agglomeration in the north are the main metropolitan foresight. And most uh, outlying towns and villages um, outside of those major metropolitan centers are labeled as periphery, which is both geographic, they are more remote, and there's a lot of commuting involved if you want to come to the center because we really support a long strip of land from north to south, so commutes from north to south are quite long. Um, and there is also social periphery, which is the Poor neighborhoods of the major cities. They are close to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, but they have poor concentrations of immigrants. This is where Ethiopian immigrants live. This is where third generation Israeli immigrants live. And many Russian Jews were compelled to settle in the same places of disadvantage uh, merely for the reasons of the cost of living. They could not afford to live in the major metropolitan centers like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem because. The living costs in Israel have always been high, and they're just skyrocketing with every year. So, even a couple of years ago, was considered the most expensive city in the world on par with Manhattan, certain areas of California, while the income is much, much lower. Um, so, many new immigrants are compelled by the forces of social stratification of economic. You know, disadvantage or the attempts to make it to, to buy a house, to buy a home, to find a job, they are uh, compelled to live in peripheral areas where actually their chances for good work and good schooling for their children are much lower than in the center because there are major gaps in living standards between central and peripheral areas. Um, very high rates of uh, post-secondary higher education among former Soviet Jews were well known for 
they are propensity to higher education, including their children to study. About 60% have degrees that most of them do not use them in the labor market, which is very small and was simply unable to absorb all the professionals and creative uh, people of different stripes. Um, all the rich corporate and recent arrivals are still very marginal in Israel, quite alienated from the mainstream, whatever it is, mostly due to their poor Hebrew language proficiency and residential and economic segregation. Just an illustration of what I said this is the composition of first generation immigrants who are now living in Israel, about 35%. Um, were born abroad, and we see that almost half of those who are born abroad are Jews of four percent origin. Now, when we look at Russian speaking Israelis um, as a segment, as a group, as a community, they're also incredibly heterogeneous. Of course, they come from all those different post Soviet places. Um, pretty much the only common denominator is the Russian language and the certain elements of Russian Soviet culture, which they studied in school and at the university. But beyond that, they're extremely different. First of all, um, a seminal factor in uh, making them so different is when they arrive. The time of Aliyah. Aliyah is immigration to Israel. It's an Israeli Hebrew term that means. Uh, Ascent Jews coming from lower diasporic places to Israel, which is supposed to be Jerusalem in particular, quite great. So, Aliyah is the way for Jews to Israel. The bulk arrived in the early 90s, and by now they are old timers who are mostly secular and politically very often define themselves as secular Jewish nationalists. Um, if you're interested in, in, in this particular affiliation and the location on the political map of Israel, I can comment on that in the um, But the um, two things are important that they mostly remain circular, right circular, remain circular, the children are circular. Uh, not many of them discovered religion, and, but they became much more nationalist than, than we used to be before coming to Israel. Recent arrivals, um, there are usually many questions about the so called Putin's Aliyah, the recent waves that um, started coming to Israel after 20, uh, 2012, the second uh, Putin's uh, term, the third term after he. Made his break and then he came back to power, and there were getting hopes that he will uh, not be president again. And the hopes were crushed, and the protests started, and so there was more and more uh, political opposition in Russia that was increasingly crushed. So uh, those who had some Jewish affiliation chose to come to Israel because this is, of course, the easiest destination of the. Uh, Immigration for anyone with the Jewish connection. So the Aliyah, which was very low between 2000 and 2012, actually spiked to some extent. So we had two to three times more people coming every year. And of course, after the beginning of the war in uh, the beginning of 2022, there was another spike of. Uh, a youth who came from uh, mostly from Russia, but some of them are from the Ukraine. Um, but uh, those newcomers who've been in the country for less than a decade, and some of them just for a couple of years, um, they are less integrated, of course, than the Hebrew basic or a nun. They are ethnically mixed, most of them are intermarried, and they have quite a distant connection to Jewish ethnic. In fact, they mostly they are the grandchildren of the Jews. Because the law of return, the main law that shapes uh, immigration to Israel, defines the entitlement for the Israeli citizenship up to third generation death. So it's enough to have one Jewish grandparent on either side 
in the same or on the same side in order to be eligible for the Israeli visa and bring your immediate family to Israel. So most of the, the immigrants who have been coming over the last 20 years are so-called Nepalese, the grandchildren of the Jews. Well, no longer alive, but his grandparents are in, in, in the better world by now. And their connections to, to their Jewish identity is quite famous and weak. Some of them developed in Israel, others not. Um, and their politics is more liberal and universalist than it was in my generation, in the 90s. More of them are liberal and left universalist. Socialized in, uh, you know, the Russia, the big cities of Russia, they mostly come from Moscow and St. Petersburg, like 80% of their company is too major in the Soviet Union, where those people were usually creative professionals and they travel the world and they speak English and they, they're very different from the generations that came in. Now, another line of heterogeneity, of course, is by education and occupation before and after Aliyah. Those who came with significant human capital and with uh, marketable skills applicable in the Israeli market, of course, people who are like, you know, engineering, high tech, medicine, and all kinds of applicable occupations, they are in a better position as immigrants than those who are. In uh, narratives of language related disciplines, who have a great stress of uh, finding themselves in the Hebrew speaking society. The Hebrew is a very complicated language. You know, for people who never studied it and just discover it in midlife, it's an unsurmountable barrier. You know, you can master it to the level that would allow them to work professionally. Uh, by ethnicity. Many of uh, the, the Jews who came from the former Soviet lands are mm -hmm. uh, from the Caucasus and Central Asia. They are not Ashkenazim, they're closer to Israel, to Eastern Jewry. Um, and um, they speak different languages other than Russian. And they are actually integrating more successfully, I would say, than Ashkenazi Jews from the neighboring cities of Russia. Um, by religiosity, over 75% are still secular, and about 20% call themselves traditional. They are mostly in focuses on Central Asia. About 5% are Orthodox, and usually they are what we call Balei Shuba, people who discovered religion later in life, and, you know, as adults, and they became Orthodox, newly Orthodox in, uh, in Israel. But it's, it's not a large percentage. Some of them Live uh, in the settlements and uh, or in uh, conservation of the uh, Jews, but it's a very uncommon scenario for us. And then, of course, there's this angle of generations, which is my favorite line of analysis comparing immigrant generation one that is, the parents, the adult migrants who came, uh, let's say, in the, the 20s plus. And, uh, had a very difficult time, but still they were more prepared for this journey of the center. And then there's their children, generation 1.5, children and adolescents who were uprooted by force by their parents. They never asked for this to happen. Very often they were miserable. The second generation is the children of immigrants born in, in Israel in the country. Uh, and it's again a different story. Every generation is very different. So, if we take a look at the key challenges for Russian Israelis, uh, number one barrier that people talk about in interviews and surveys, what problems the most is the socioeconomic barriers to the village. Uh, like I said, the Soviet Jews are exceptionally. Um, highly educated kind of people. And they came to Israel very often expecting that their human capital, that their skills, that their diplomas would be useful in Israel. They would be able to, you know, to, to find jobs comparable to what they were doing before immigration in their cities in Moscow, and, and Kiev, and Ashkent, and Tbilisi, and all kinds of uh, big cities where they live. 
But basically, what they discovered that 60 to 70 percent of all the Soviet degrees and diplomas turned to be rather useless in the world, which is a common story for immigrants, you know, in other places as well. It's true also about America, and here I show the comparative graph of uh, immigrant occupations uh, in America, which is very similar to the distribution of um, kinds of occupations among Russian speakers in Israel. This Occupation of downgrading, we need to make a living with any kind of work you can find. And uh, you know, maybe hoping to climb slowly the occupational ladder back to your former career, former occupational self-identity. Um, it's uh, for most adult immigrants, it's never a lot. So particularly in Israel where the market is very, very small, it's a tiny country. So there are very few Positions. There are very few firms, very few organizations. And particularly those who came later on found that all the potential openings have already been filled. So there's no work. Engineers and teachers and you know, musicians or lecturers or journalists. The difference, of course, with America is the huge scale of the American labor market. You do not succeed in New York, you go to Chicago, you don't succeed in Chicago, you go to Minnesota, and, and it's the demand is bottomless for educated professionals in this country, particularly in what we call STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math. Not so in Israel. Every niche in every occupation mm -hmm. is being filled very quickly. And uh, so the majority, about two thirds of uh, professionals came with my wave in the 90s, found themselves uh, making a living of all kinds of uh, you know, set of skills or manual occupations. Uh, and of course, the lower socioeconomic status of the parents also spilled over the influence, lower chances for good education and uh, good uh, residential environment for their children. So there's a connection between the tracks of parents and children as immigrants. Now the issues of, uh, tell me when I have to stop, like five minutes before I have to stop. I mean, okay, because mm -hmm. we want to do some time for questions. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Um, so another cluster of issues that um, cast a shadow over the lives of Russian uh, immigrants in Israel has to do with <clears throat> the issues that we call the people that the uh, religion and state. Um, the ever national belonging, the non belonging uh, of those citizens to the country of their choice. Um, is always under question because the Jewish identity is not completely deliverable for many Israelis, particularly those who are more traditional religious themselves. Mm -hmm. They often consider all the Soviet ex Soviet immigrants like fake Jews, who uh, can be the Jews, not really Jewish. And this is because, of course, in the Soviet Union, Jewishness meant ethnicity. As we said, nationality, it's an right? right? It's, uh, it's, it, it has very little to do with religion because Judaism as a religion and as a lifestyle, and as a system of education and culture and communities of institutions have been virtually completely destroyed over the first 30, 40 years of state government. By the end of the Second World War, there was no Jewish life in the Soviet Union, virtually no Jewish life. So Soviet Jews grew up without religion, knowing very little about it. Many have negative attitudes because religion is something very backward, the primitive, like holding you back in life, right? Because the official state ideology, which we were taught at school, was atheist, state atheist. So of course, when they come to the country, the rights on its, uh, you know, on its entrance, that this is the country of the Jews, and Judaism is state religion, and that there is no separation between religion and state in Israel. They are quite merged together. Okay? 
So people who, who do not feel themselves attached to Jewish traditions, to Jewish holidays, to, who do not know Jewish languages, some elders remember Yiddish from their youth. But, you know, Hebrew is something that no Soviet Jewish child ever studied. So they had to start from scratch. You know, I first saw Hebrew letters in, in, in Wuhan, in Moscow, at the age of 30. And it was a big, big shock. I, I never saw this strange script in my life. So, and for many years, it remained a board, like not a text. So, um, no language, no cultural connections. And the Jewish identity that was ethnic and mostly negative. Because we all grew up under the shadow of an Soviet. It was not a positive way to be Jewish in the Soviet Union. It was something you tried to downplay, to defile, and not to parade, right? So the task of those newcomers was to turn their negative Jewish identity into something positive that they wanted to learn, to celebrate, you know, to, to, to be proud about. It's not an easy task for a young person. Um, and then, of course, there's an issue of a uh, mixed origin. A huge number of Soviet Jews were intermarried because in the Soviet Union we married for love, not for any other consideration. And so people uh, had non Jewish husbands and non Jewish wives, and they brought them to Israel. About 50% of all immigrant families of Soviet origin were ethnically mixed, they included Jews and not Jews. And so, by the religious common, Jewish common law that's called our Tat, the code of the Jewish common law that defines the rules of who is Jewish and who is not, uh, a big share of uh, ex Soviet Israelis are not recognized as Jews, despite being citizens. There is a gap between their status civically as, as politically you know, equal citizens. And they all have uh, <clears throat> Israeli ID numbers and Israeli passports, and they have all the political and social and economic rights in the country. The only right that they are deprived of, those who are not recognized as Jews, is uh, to get married, get divorced, to get buried in a Jewish cemetery. Because all those functions that have to do with the life ceremonies, with the status of your, your personal state, marriage, divorce, burial, registration of children as Jews, they are performed by the religious authorities, religious courts, um, and um, people who were born of the Jewish mother are Jews, and people who were born of the Jewish father, they're not the mm -hmm. Jewishness is passed on by. The maternal one. And in the Soviet Union, many people of mixed origin have a Jewish father and a non Jewish mother. It's a very common combination. And uh, having a Jewish, a Jewish father, they had a Jewish last name. So they were recognized as Jews in the Soviet Union and experienced all the fallout as Jews, all the anti Semitic slurs and limitations in their education. So they always considered themselves Jewish and mm -hmm. And when it came to Israel, it turned out that they are not really Jewish. And they were poor and they were suggested to undergo conversion to Jewish if they wanted to become real Jewish. Um, so about half in generation 1.5 and 2, the younger corporates who are incredibly intermixed ethnically, about 30% of them are recognized as Jews by uh, the rabbinate and all the rest have uh, the one of the category that is uh, called in uh, uh, Zera, they, they belong, they have some Jewish connection, but they're not selected to be Jewish. So they cannot get married in Israel because there is no civil marriage, and people who are not recognized as Jews cannot get married in the medical court and have to exit the country and get a marital certificate in Italy, in Cyprus, in, in Czech Republic, in any place they want to go, and then they can come back with a marital certificate and register in the, in the civil um, interior ministry as a, as a couple, uh, which uh, causes a lot of anger, particularly among younger Israelis who think that 
right to get married and establish a family is one of the basic civil rights of every citizen. And that's now, uh, there was a lot of uh, social discourse and political organization around the issue of conversion, the rule. Uh, it was a project that was um, paraded as an initiative of the prime minister and the chief rabbinical authority, and they tried to establish the whole process for mass conversions of uh, um, non kosher you know, non, non, not correct type of Jews, mostly speaking about former Soviet citizens, but also the Russian Jews from Argentina, from France, from Ethiopia, who are not collaborative Jewish. So this project was a mm -hmm. um, huge investment, politically, economically, but it failed miserably because only about 78% of all uh, non-Jews completed the full process of orthodox conversion to the end, and uh, they are still in the end, um, and got their status changed into being Jewish. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a topic of a separate lecture why, why it failed, but the fact is that uh, very few, particularly Russian Israelis, were prepared to undergo this very demanding complicated procedure that takes a year plus that um, mm -hmm. also assumes that once you complete the conversion you take upon yourself a commitment for the religious lifestyle you, you did so much declare that from now on you are becoming a religious Jew to observe all the rituals and all the rules of Judaism and very few people can raise their ethics and secular people are prepared to make this first commitment um so this never worked and so the four soviets remained secular and um, not really jewish in their everyday habitus and lifestyle and um, customs so the traditional religious part of the israeli population which is expanding and growing very quickly is very critical of this area and uh, demands, for example, for years to change the law of return, excluding the third generation from eligibility for the Israeli visa, and living, limiting it only to maternal Jews of uh, the first and second generation. Now, um, the, the, the barriers that have to do with politics and culture. And also the issues of belonging and you know, to which tribe do we attach ourselves, where we are, where do we belong? Because in, in, in the Israeli society, it's very important to have some kind of attachment in every society, in Israel especially. So the Soviet Jews encountered the Ashkenazi Mizrahi divide only in Israel. They never suspected that it exists. It exists. Because in the Soviet Union, we were simply Jews, as opposed to non-Jews, right? And all the Jews were the same. The absolute majority living in the major cities of uh, the European part of the Soviet Union were Ashkenazim, hailing from the pale of settlement before the revolution and after the revolution, coming to Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic states, Moldova, Transylvania, Bessarabia, all those huge areas where the Jews historically lived, and then many of them resettled in the central part of the Soviet Union, left behind their Jewish lifestyle, became secular Soviet citizens. And so they never knew that there are different kinds of Jews. Um, they met these large Jews for the first time in Israel. And uh, um, very often Russian <clears throat> newcomers were settled in the areas where traditionally these rights first and third generation still remain from the 50s and 60s in the peripheries of Israel. So there was a lot of conflict and loving elders between those very different tribes in terms of their everyday culture and uh, lifestyle and values and whatever. So there was a lot of conflict between. Russian and Israeli Jews in uh, the political towns of Israel. But um, what's more, the veteran Ashkenazi Jews, the elites living in prestigious 
areas of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, the Kaifa, they never recognized the Russian, the Russian speakers, as part of their own language, their own category. Okay. Uh, despite the fact that, of course, we hail from the same root, so we all come from the Yiddish country, Yiddish speaking people from the Pale of Seven, the Russian Empire, the same But uh, Ashkenazi elites of Israel look down on uh, Russian speakers for many reasons, because they were mostly located in low socioeconomic groups, because they lived in bad neighborhoods, and their children went to lots of good schools, and uh, because they worked in uh, manual occupations and they were not lawyers or doctors or professors in the university, like Ashkenazi, proper, you know, um, people with the real status in the country. Um, and then there was a stigma attached to any Russian Soviet legacy, you know, Russian people who come from the Soviet Union who were labeled as uh, coming from totalitarian society, not from you know, democratic thinking, limited in their understanding. Um, and of course, it didn't count that politically, most former Soviet Jews gradually drifted from the center to the right. Like I said, they became secular Jewish nationalists. They voted for the parties of Likud and uh, they say know, which is which, which is a party that was founded by a Russian speaking Jew from Moldova, uh, the Lieberman. Uh, to this day it's quite a popular party which is now split pizza pizza between Russian and non-Russian voters in Israel. And uh, so the fact that politically Russian Jews were not on the left, which is a traditional political affiliation of Ashkenazi Jews in Israel, like most of American Jews, of course, because it's a very similar split in this country. So the former Soviet Jews are mostly voting Republican, and the American Jews are mostly voting with the Democrats. So it's, it's a mirror image. And this is also true in Germany and in every other place where ex Soviet uh, immigrants sit. So this was another reason why Ashkenazi elites rejected and distanced themselves from uh, the new Russian immigrants and were not really willing to help them, you know, to settle, to find jobs, to recommend them for, you know, for professional opportunities. So um, former Soviet Jews were very much upset, you know, frustrated, um, Hurt by the slap of solidarity and recognition. And being rejected by the Ashkenazi brethren, alienated from the Hebrew culture, also because they never, many of them never mastered Hebrew, particularly the older segment. Russians have built their own cultural arena, cultural microcosm in Israel, which included Russian language media. Schools, theater companies, libraries, groceries, businesses, whatnot. It's something that we call the Russian street of Israel, metaphorically, so the physical street, although there are streets where you mostly see Russian versions of Haifa and Tel Aviv and But this street is kind of a virtual um, community that sets the ties between people of the same language, origin, and culture and different institutions and venues, given their critical mass, the 40%, again, I, I tell you, it's a very huge uh, segment of the population. There was even a discussion in the Knesset for 15 years ago, initiated by Russian speaker, Knesset member, to include Russian in, as a national language, as a formal official language. Because we have two official languages, it's uh, Hebrew, Arabic, and English. The English is kind of you know, used for tourists and for everything is, is written for languages. So there was a proposal to include Russian in the South that was not accepted. Still, in, in the commercial sector, you know, every label and every everything you buy in the supermarket and you know, the drugs, they all have signatures also in Russian because, of course, the consumer market has its own. Rules and uh, requirements. So, de facto, Russian language is important. Um, 
clash. <clears throat> a few words about the younger generations. This is actually a topic that I'm going to <clears throat> elaborate on in my other lecture in uh, Harvard on uh, February 7th. So there's going to be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Um, it's a fascinating group of immigrants actually across the world. There is generation 1.5 in America, in Canada, in Germany, in every country. It's uh, immigrants who were unwilling movers, who were taken by their parents, like I said, usually. And their identity is split because they spent part of their <clears throat> formative years in Russia, Ukraine, you know, in their home countries, and um, had some schooling there. Many of them know how to read and write, and they have friends, and they have memories, and they had a good life. And then their parents decided one day that they would go to Israel with no reason whatsoever. And they took their kids. And so uh, this resettlement in Daputi was very traumatic for many children. Today, they are young adults <clears throat> between the ages of 35 and 35 years old. And uh, despite their Israeli, mostly Israeli education and in Hebrew, Many are still recognizable due to their Russian names and accent and demeanor and the way they dress. Um, so um, they are very interested, an interesting crowd because they are um, much less prone to comply with discrimination and to accept their position as second rate citizens. Um, and you know, to tolerate negative stereotypes and slurs, and you know, Russians go home, and Russian prostitutes, and Russian mafia, and all the labels that are attached to Russian speaking of it across the world. Uh, the first generation was silent, they received it as an inevitable byproduct of immigration. You know, we have to, to shut up and work hard and get the test. What, what can we do? And the children are not yeah. willing to, to cope with that. They protest, they organize, they start all kinds of movements and groups to influence politically and to change this reality. So there's much more civic activism on the cultural front and the online communities at the time, volunteering for different organizations. That is much more prevalent among the global fighters than it was in that day. Their political views are also changing. They're much more dispersed vis a vis the really block of right wing views mm -hmm. of the parents. There are many more uh, young generations who are more liberal, who are more centrist, or more to the left, or extreme left. So um, this is also critical for immigrants. Now, the young crowd is much more cosmopolitan. Many of them speak decent English, and they're quite open to explore educational career opportunities outside Israel, as opposed to the parental generation, which usually moves and stays because it's very difficult to immigrate once again and to look for you know good fortunes elsewhere. This is a much more mobile population, they're much more globally um, attached. And the in surveys, only about 50% of them. Say that they're sure to stay in Israel for me. Well, a few words of the ways, like I mentioned already, this is usually what people ask. It's uh, um, it's about 100,000 um, over the last five years, I would say, but mostly they came after the invasion of Ukraine and particularly after the mobilization of young men into the army in September 22. Mm -hmm. uh, from all three republics, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, but mostly from Russia itself. Um, relatively few Ukrainians came to Israel. If either as refugees or as Korean, as Jewish immigrants, usually mm -hmm. only those who already have families, children, siblings, because uh, Ukrainians have many more opportunities in, in other countries. As you know, Ukrainian refugees were welcome in Europe and you know, in the States and in Canada, and they were accepted virtually everywhere. While for Russians who were politically you know, opposed to the regime, were in trouble, 
uh, they had nowhere to go because actually the Russian passport became top secret. People, nobody wanted to accept Russian citizens. Every bill of the Russian passport and Russian speakers considered a collaborator with Putin's regime, which is not true, of course, and there's major position to the war. So for those those of them who had uh, an Israeli connect and uh, Jewish connection, the easiest option was to go to Israel. Um, now um, they, they're very interesting people, mostly young, but mostly coming from the Navy cities and mostly belonging to creative occupations, postmodern creative occupations. They face huge career hurdles in Israel, they have very little chance of planting, replanting their careers as um, coaches, event organizers, organizational counselors, all kinds of postmodern virtual occupations, you know. They're no longer engineers and nurses, or people that can do something with their hands. So all those occupations are very much rooted in language and culture, and it's very hard to move them to a different country. And of course, Hebrew is a huge you know, So some of them keep working um, online in the Russian jobs as long as they can, or they work in English, if they belong to the iPad and uh, computer industries. But many of them are not doing so well, and as we know, many of them are already leaving Israel, mm -hmm. either going back to Russia or um, moving to the West if they have such an opportunity. And of course, they're all in deep shock in the current context in the world with Hamas because they went for one war and right into them. Um, so, concluding thoughts, just very briefly, ex Soviet Aliyah has been a great blessing to Israel. There's no doubt about it. It was a mass influx of free human capital in which Israel did not invest as people came educated, graduated to enter the labor market. And much of it was wasted, unfortunately, because the labor market was too small to accommodate them all. Uh, but still, Russian Aliyah of the 90s uh, spearheaded economic upsurge of the 90s and quite that. Room of the early 2000s, and also helped offset the ongoing lift towards religious the majority of the country, which is an ongoing phenomenon. Um, for the Jews themselves, Russian speaking Jews themselves, it was a mixed blessing, probably. On the one hand, they had some demographic revival, um, the fertility rates went up, they have some more kids than they used to have in Russia. The generation 1.5 is coming between uh, two and three, so five and four kids, which is a very really norm. And they hardly have one in Russia. So, demographically, the futures are better for them. But professionally, many of them experience downgrading and couldn't realize themselves in the Israeli market. Uh, and also, like I tried to illustrate, they are quite ambivalent about their social belonging, falling in between different Israeli groups. So the question now, uh, questions are that <clears throat> the generations 1.5 and 2, hopefully they remain in Israel. Um, then I would like to finish by showing you a few pictures from our ethnographic studies of generation 1.5, a typical uh, initiative that they organized. It's, uh, it's called uh, City Weddings, at the Nava Kitara Eid in Tel Aviv, uh, Central Places. This organization called Fishka, an association of the generation 1.5, uh, Russian speaking and Hebrew speaking bilingual, mm -hmm. organized weddings for the so called Psileshi Tum, the people who can learn the language in Hebrew. Because they're not recognized as Jews, like I explained. So uh, mm -hmm. this organization paid for and organized the dress and the music and the food. And there was a, a huge crowd that celebrated with them. So it was just a, uh, a kind of political manifestation and a protest against the inability of so many young Russian Israelis to get married in Israel. You see that this couple also has a child. They're just getting married. This is an example of how this uh, again, mm -hmm. this association introduced a popular Russian Soviet holiday virtually unknown in Israel, the 8th of 
March, with International Women's Day, uh, walking the streets of the South Korea, mostly for workers, Africans they are living, uh, explaining them about uh, solidarity between working women, giving them flowers, music, you know, so it's uh, another reason to celebrate. And this is a very interesting project of this association, Kishka, uh, Mimuna C, Russian Mimuna. Mimuna is the last day of the traditional Passover festival, finishing it, breaking it when uh, um, the people stop eating matzot and switch back to eating pastry. It's a Moroccan holiday, a very Mizrahi with Mizrahi traditions. So, this is a, a Russian club that is staging this. Um, Russian Nuna with the chef Gova, who is cooking uh, uh, the traditional Moroccan mufleta, which is a sweet pastry, to this holiday and Russian leeches. So it's it's a way to celebrate different cooking traditions of Russian and Mizrahi Jews, and of course they play Russian and Eastern music. So it was a very nice bridging again. And the final picture is. It's, it's from the TV series that was very popular and controversial. It was liked very much by most to Israeli veterans and sabres, and uh, disliked by most Russian immigrants I know. Maybe some of you have seen it, if, if you know some, some people you can watch it online. Uh, this, the, the name of the series is Sovietska. This is she is the main heroine, this generation one point five young woman who is exactly in this in between position, struggling between her Russian and Soviet Jewish family and trying to be true Israeli young woman. Liberator, she was a student, mathematics student at her university. An interesting story, but full of stereotypes. So this is what we did like. But you know, it's uh, just a way to see the, the show that this particular snap of the younger uh, Russian speaking Israelis is very much in the spotlight of the Israeli mainstream media sites. It was streamed on the uh, main public TV channel. So um, this is how I finish. And I'm open to your questions.